<clears throat> so the class is being recorded. This is eight thirty B, and we're doing uh, the chapters on weathering height. I think uh, we have we have uh, chapters five and six. Okay. So uh, I'm I'm hopeful that by now you have you are perhaps halfway through the novel, or perhaps some of you have finished it. Uh, alternatively, uh, I asked you to. Um, um, go and watch the movie uh, if there is a movie. And I'm sure there are lots of uh, cinematic adaptations of the novel. But you need to also be alerted and reminded of the fact that movies have their, I mean, directors have their own way of doing stuff. Uh, whatever you read is not going to be identical with whatever you're going to watch, but at least uh, the, the basic storyline is going to be there. Um, OK, so let's go to the talking points that we have. And uh, start. So um, uh, I'm not sharing, I'm sorry, I'm not sharing. Uh, excuse me, sir. Let me let me share and then we can always do. OK. Can you see that? Yes, Dr. yes. OK, good. So somebody wanted something. Go ahead very quickly. Mm, yes. How can I help you? Okay. Uh, I was about to say that can't hear clearly, Julie. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I can't hear clearly. Ah, uh, yeah, perhaps you have. Uh, you need to. Uh, if everybody else can hear me clearly, it means that you have a problem. You may want to go out and then come back, and this may solve the problem. Uh, can everybody hear me well over there? Yes, doctor. OK, so yeah, Sarah, you're invited to go out and come back. Inshallah, that, that will solve the problem. Um, OK. So let me start. Like I said, this is going to be chapter five and hopefully uh, chapter six. And like I said, um, chapter five is more or less like uh, an introduction to chapter six. Then the bulky part is going to be uh, chapter six. So chapter five um, and it's weathering heights and it's uh, home and the concept of home. Um, we have uh, spoken enough about what home means uh, in the Victorian age. I mean, home is about security, is about safety, is about the established um, role of women at home and what they can provide for their husbands for their uh, kids and the other members of the family. While uh, approach would be whatever is strange, whatever is foreign uh, and so on. Um, we spoke about the aim of this part. Um, so I'm not going to go into details about that. Um, again, you will have this idea of readership uh, getting repeated. There is this focus on readers and how they interpret uh, texts. And when I when I say readers, I would mean um, casual readers like me and you. Uh, I would also mean critics and uh, critics, whether we're talking about uh, the time when the novel was published or even now. Um, again, critical reception of the novel. We'll talk about the setting, the place, especially uh, the different houses that we have. Talk about the characters, especially the character of Heathcliff. Um, the focus was on Heathcliff and when the novel was published, but much later you will have people talking about other uh, characters and considering them as important as Heathcliff especially the character of Catherine. 
uh, especially when we talk about feminist criticism, where the focus is on women and their roles and whether they are being treated fairly or not. Okay? Narration is also very important in the novel. And it's simply because it's um, it's not just another narration that we have where you normally have one narrator telling uh, or narrating the whole story. We're going to have more than one narrator, which is obviously new, uh, at least at the time it was new. We're going to have more than one narrator. Uh, we'll talk about uh, frame narrative and then the other uh, narrators that we will have. Structure of the novel is very important. The idea of different generations and uh, echoing the actions and the idioms of each other. We'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about um, this idea uh, of um, hybridity, the fact that the novel has more than one uh, genre. It's uh, cross generic, if you like, where uh, you have romance, you have realism, uh, you, you also have um, uh, in, in, in gothic elements and all these kinds of things. Spoke enough about Emily Pronte and the fact that she had sisters who also uh, were uh, as talented. Spoke about the family uh, tree and the different generations that we have the novel and that may be one reason why the novel is complex, the fact that you have different generations, they have similar names. Um, and the question uh, is normally asked whether uh, Emily Pronte meant that uh, or not. Was it in design? Uh, did she mean uh, to, to do that or was it just uh, <coughs> Um, you know, incidental and accidental. And the answer, the short answer is yes, she meant it. <clears throat> the idea of doubling, uh, the idea of having different generations, uh, yeah, the idea of having um, different narr narrators, it's, it's all uh, obviously meant. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if we talk about the novel in terms of narrators, you will have uh, Lockwood uh, and Nelly as uh, two main narrators, and then you will have um, other voices. You will have um, um, the diaries of certain uh, characters like Catherine. Um, you will have other characters, um, you know, uh, speaking out and narrating their part of the story. So we have different points of view due to uh, the different voices. You will have in the first generation, you will have uh, Kathy uh, or Catherine having or keeping a diary where she, uh, you know, kind of scraped things. Um, and the, uh, the idea of narration is going to be always associated with the idea of reading. Um, if you read, you um, you're right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, remember when we started, we spoke about the reception of the novel and we said that the novel was underappreciated and misunderstood. Again, that is simply because of the um, excessive uh, violence that we had in the novel and also um, the idea uh, and also the fact that it is a complex novel in terms of its, its structure, it's uh, like I said, cross generic. Um, it has a bit of everything, and that would uh, sometimes complicate uh, things. Um, and um, you can always compare it to other, um, you know, straightforward novels before, before it, and that would, um, you know, kind of. Uh, point to the complexity, um, uh, its complexity and um, and all these things. So novels before this kind of novel were, were very straightforward. You have one storyline, the ideas are very clear, you don't have many uh, facets uh, of meaning, the interpretation is also very straightforward. 
But uh, this time around with this novel, it's different. Again, you have excessive violence and also which is obviously uh, something that the Victorians were not uh, very used to. And also um, the uh, idea of, um, you know, multiple narrators and multiple structures and multiple genres and so on and so forth. Um, again, um, in order to check whether the novel was well received or not, you normally go to the uh, journals and the newspapers of the time. Among them were the Spectator, uh, the Gerald's Weekly, uh, and others. Where I mean, they they seem to agree on the fact that the the novel is very disagreeable. Um, they find it Im improbable. Um, they they find it uh, extreme in its depiction of violence. And the spectator um, or the critics in the spectator said uh, just that. In the Gerald's Weekly, um, we have a shift where um, the critics obviously look at, at, the, at the novel from a different angle and they believe that the novel has this imaginative power and they even call uh, uh, the writer, um, um, a dramatic artist. And of course, when we talk about drama, we talk about uh, heightened tensions, we talk about um, um, verbal, um, uh, verbal abilities, the, the verbal abilities of the characters, uh, poeticity, creativity, and all these kinds of things. <clears throat> Um, again, the general feeling and impression about the novel is that it is m morally tinted or corrupt and it's very gloomy. And I'm sure you have noticed that while reading the novel. So it doesn't seem to confirm to the Victorian ideal of home as we know it. Um, again, we're talking about the how it was received. I mean, the novel and the examiner, which is one of the newspapers, were the, they would describe the novel as um, a, a drama set in a rude old house. And by rude here, they mean uh, rough and, um, you know, not a normal kind of house. And of course, um, you would have this room, wild romantic image where the house, the, this old house is set in the high moors, uh, and moors are wild areas. And in the north of England, where the villages are, um, and we're going to always make this, this distinction between the north, uh, north England values and those of London and the south. Obviously, uh, they are pitted against each other, where uh, Wuthering Heights would uh, represent North England uh, rustic uh, values. Uh, people are rough, they are villagers for the most part. They are not very civilized. Yeah, and you would always compare them to, to the people of London and to the people of the South uh, who, have, uh, who are more civilized and who are, uh, you know, more educated uh, and everything. Who is representing North England, uh, of course, um, and its values, it would be uh, Heathcliff and the other um, uh, people in Wuthering Heights. And who is going to be representing uh, London and, and, and the South uh, of England, that uh, would be uh, the main narrator. Uh, what's his name? Um, Lockwood. Lockwood would be representing those, um, you know, South England values and, you know, levels. It's, it's a different level of civilization. Uh, the Athenum obviously focuses on the interior of the house and uh, they would consider the house a prison. Um, again, the inside is a prison and the outside of the house uh, remember, it, the house is on top of a hill and um, it is hit um, by and struck by, you know, strong uh, storms and uh, it's, it's always stormy outside the house and this 
uh, stormy and violent, and that uh, would uh, reflect whatever is happening inside the house. So the inside and the outside are identical in terms of violence, in terms of uh, storms and all these kinds of things. Um, again, uh, there is going to be talk about the character, the main character himself, Heathcliff, and how he is looked upon, uh, and whether he has literary uh, antecedents, whether uh, we had uh, uh, in literature people who were like him, characters like him. And when you dig deep into um, literature and the history of literature, you will have characters like Heathcliff. Uh, he would at one point uh, be, um, you know, in a kind of um, compared to um, Byronic heroes uh, who are for the most uh, part uh, you know, different, foreign, um, rough and tough, and more or less like the character. If you're familiar with Othello, we have done Othello and um, look at how he used to look and then look at how he used to behave. So um, uh, Heathcliff is going to be compared to lots of other characters before him in literature, like uh, Byronic figures. He's going to also be compared to Gothic heroes uh, who have violent and elemental passions. Um, <clears throat> um, again, even uh, the women characters are not spared. Uh, people talk about them and they say that those uh, female characters were daring um, and unsuitable of um, I mean, their, their, whatever they did, their, their behavior was unsuitable of, uh, of women. Remember, we're talking about women in the Victorian age, uh, women that were uh, presented as uh, more or less uh, as obedient, uh, less assert uh, assertive people who have, um, you know, who um, or whom society has expectations of, and they shouldn't go beyond uh, those expectations. I mean, the idea of staying at home, the idea of uh, providing care and security and safety to the other members of the family, especially the male among them. Okay, so um, most, if not all the Victorian reviews focused on the novel as being strange and as being different from accepted Victorian ideals, uh, values, and concepts. So it's dark, this is what they say, it's gloomy, it's violent, and it is also corrupt. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you have seen and felt in this way uh, if you have started reading the novel. The characters, be, uh, I mean, their behavior uh, were inappropriate. Inappropriate according to whom? What are the standards? The standards are obviously uh, the standards of the Victorian uh, age. Um, look at the, uh, this is, um, this is uh, obviously a reconstruction of the house. This is how people imagine uh, weathering heights. Uh, as you can see, it's on top of a hill. It's, um, you know, out in in, um, in a wild area. But it can give you different feelings, depending on what kind of mood you are in, depending on what kind of uh, preferences you have. But for the most part, um, you don't have other houses around. You don't, it's, um, it's a wide and broad area uh, where obviously it's going to be very cold because uh, of the, the lack of other houses. And even the house looks old um, and it looks sinister. Um, it can be very disturbing, especially at night. Um, again, of course, you know that we have um, um, yani doubles. Uh, you have two homes, you have uh, two generations, you have two main uh, narrators. It's, it's all 
about this idea of twos. Um, um, and when when you have twos, you normally have one uh, one of the one one side is pitted against uh, the other. So if we talk about the homes, you have weathering heights, and once you also have a fresh uh, uh, cross grange. And obviously there is a difference. Weathering heights is rough, is like we have seen on top of a hill. Um, it's old and all these kinds of things. While fresh uh, or thrush uh, cross grange is going to be the opposite. It's, it's, uh, it's a well organized house. It's, uh, I mean, its inhabitants are civilized and educated. But there is going to be always this comparison between weathering heights, the house and uh, thrush cross grange. <clears throat> okay, the the least you can say about weathering heights the house is that it is unhomely. It's an an unhomely place. So uh, unhomely it would be the opposite of homely. Homely would be beautiful, would be simple, would be secure and safe while unhomely would give you the opposite and would evoke uh, opposite meanings of violence, opposite meanings of, uh, you know, uh, stormy relationships and all these kinds of things. So a uh, thrush cross grange, uh, the, home, the home would be a symbol of the antique farm house with respectable uh, residents or people. So there is going to always be this contrast between the two houses um, the values of the characters are going to within those two houses are going to reflect um, the idea of home and approved. Whatever is strange, whatever is weird is going to be approved, even if you are at home. And whatever is safe and whatever is decent and civilized is going to be um, home, even if you are um, you know, physically approved. Um, again, there is going to always be this comparison uh, between nature and, and civilization, uh, which is better to be, uh, to live uh, a natural kind of life. You don't have access to education. You don't have access uh, to anything because uh, obviously, according to some people and philosophers, education corrupts. Uh, um, so you you would have this side, and you would have the other side would be nurture or civilization, where you have you read and, and write, you um, go to school, you are um, civilized. And, uh, so those two concepts are going to also be pitted against each other, men and women. Uh, there is going to also be uh, this comparison between romantic and Victorian values. Victorian is about serenity. Uh, Victorian values are about, you know, uh, um, you know, beha behaving according to um, rules and regulations, having standards that you look up to. You're very conservative. Uh, there is nothing revolutionary about your life. This is Victorian values, and the other values are the romantic values. Romantic values are about being wild, uh, being natural, uh, are also about uh, being revolutionary, uh, not taking things, uh, things for, for granted. Uh, and you will have characters who are representing Victorian uh, values, and you're going to also have characters representing romantic values uh, like Catherine, like Heathcliff, and, and all these kinds of things. So, um, uh, the landscape outside is a spatial expression, is going to be uh, an expression of themes and emotions uh, within the houses, especially uh, weathering heights. Uh, okay, so the two houses, um, and of course, if you have two houses, you have owners um, of the two houses. The um, weathering heights, um, is um, owned by the end shows, while the thrush cross range is uh, owned by the Lentons. And um, the, the first generation will have 
um, the father, Mr. Deng Chu, and his wife, and the fact that they, they used to live um, in a simple kind of life until Deng Chu goes to Liverpool, and when he comes back, he has um, Heathcliff, who is um, a boy, and he adopts him. Uh, we don't know about he, he, Heathcliff's origin. Um, Heathcliff is going to be raised by them, and then life gets in the way, and Mr. Dan Cho is going to die, and then his son Henley is going to take over and is going to treat Heathcliff in the worst of manners, and Heathcliff is going to develop, uh, obviously, um, complexes and, um, and issues and uh, revenge is going to be always on his mind. Um, um, again, the, the Linton, we don't have that with the Linton, um, at least with the first generation where there, there was Mr. and Mrs. Linton, they use, uh, and then they, they represent the civilized part of the story where uh, even their house is well organized. Uh, it doesn't have the roughness of uh, weathering heights as a house. Um, again, um, they would represent, uh, I mean, peace and comfort. Um, and they behave in a civilized and, and decent way. They represent civilization, while the uh, people of weathering heights would represent nature. Um, and lack of culture. Um, uh, they would represent extreme emotions, um, you know, uh, elemental passions, um, gothic uh, elements, uh, uh, being primitive, and, and everything. Okay, that would give you also, if you look at the picture, that can also give you um, a sense of what kind of um, uh, nature, what kind of atmosphere uh, Weathering Heights was uh, set. As you can see, it's um, it's a wild area and um, it's empty. Um, you don't have the warmth of, of neighbors around you. If you're sick, they go, they come to you and they, uh, they come to your rescue. You don't have any of that. So it's only natural that people in the house are going to develop very strange behaviors uh, and stuff. Um, um, again, we need somebody to um, to tell us about uh, the house, the weathering, uh, weathering um, heights, and how it looks. And uh, and uh, uh, we have Lockwood, the frame narrator somebody who comes from the south with its different values and obviously he is in the north i mean like a tourist he is touring uh, the country and um, um, it so happens that he will be uh, living in the grange for a while and then uh, move to weathering heights and of course the shift from uh, the civilized grange uh, to um, the um, uncivilized and the natural weathering heights would be a, a big move. You're moving from um, civilization to uh, the lack thereof. Um, again, the, the first impression um, uh, look would, would have of weathering heights that it is um, well organized inside, but there are things that uh, will uh, perhaps change his opinion when, I mean, how he was um, uh, treated by the owner of the house, uh, Mr. Heathcliff, um, uh, and, um, um, and Kathy, and uh, people are obviously tough and rough inside the house. You have uh, mentioning of dogs and uh, guns, and that would all indicate that there is something uh, uncanny about this kind of thing, something strange about this house. Um, again, if you look at the house, if you go inside the house, it's a typical kind of house that would show you that people are uh, perhaps prosperous and wealthy, but 
you would have other actions by the owner, the landlord, Mr. Heathcliff, uh, and the other members of the family. Um, they would behave in a manner that, that is threatening and that is disturbing. Um, and even he, he, he refers to Heathcliff as a brutal master, and he would refer to the house as um, the lonely house. So as you can see, the opening scene sets the tone of the novel. We are in for uh, whatever is strange, whatever is uncanny, and whatever is um, opposite uh, of um, you know, the values of the Victorian age. Um, again, um, the admiration of the house, I mean, I'm talking about Lockwood's admira admiration for the house, is very short-lived. Uh, he feels the warmth and um, he, um, he, he enjoys um, the good food until uh, he starts to, to meet people like him, Catherine, like Heathcliff, um, with his ungentlemanly behavior. And, and it's there and then that he starts to kind of reflect on, on why people are behaving the way uh, they do. Um, <clears throat> so it is very gloomy. Uh, even um, he sees things. I mean, he sees like a ghost looming uh, on the horizon, on, on his window, and he has this belief that the house is haunted. So again, we're going to always compare the homely values uh, of the Victorian age and the strange, threatening uh, atmosphere that uh, we have in Wuthering Heights. Uh, at one point, one critic would refer to Wuthering Heights as the setting of a drama. And uh, so it's a drama. Drama means that you have, remember when, when I talk about a drama, I talk about something very big, something very, uh, uh, I mean, close. Yani, always refer back to the dramas that you have done. Look at Dr. Faustus and the atmosphere that Dr. Faustus was set uh, with and by. Look at uh, Othello, for example, and those grand passions that we have and those elemental uh, uh, passions that uh, Othello had and stuff. So it's, it's a drama. It has the atmosphere, this is spectacular atmosphere of drama where uh, tension uh, is rising, where you have conflicts that you have. You have this atmosphere in Wuthering Heights and the, the, the place itself uh, can fit, can be fit for, uh, can be a setting, an ideal and a perfect setting for a drama. Again, we're talking about a rude, old-fashioned house that is rough and rustic. Uh, we're talking about the place being on, on, on top of one of the high moors. And this is, that would add to the drama. Um, uh, again, um, the characters within, with their violence and elemental passion, uh, passion that would also uh, be uh, like being in a drama. And so what do we have outside the house? We have, like I said, um, you know, open space, um, unfriendly atmosphere, elemental uh, weather, uh, freezing cold. That would also add to, uh, to, to, to the novel. And that would also reflect um, the violence that the characters um, uh, have, their improper behavior inside and everything in between. <clears throat> so it's, uh, the house is located in stormy weather. And again, um, that would reflect um, the violence that we have inside. So 
So exterior, exterior means outside. Exterior landscapes would symbolize the events in the story. Um, uh, thrush cross branch uh, during the first generation uh, is a totally different story. Um, if um, Weathering Heights is um, a symbol of nature, um, a symbol of life um, that lacks uh, civilization and access to decency and everything. So uh, Thrush Cross Grange is a totally different story. It's a house that um, typically uh, represent and mirror or mirrors the ideals uh, of the Victorian age, um, the idea of domesticity, the idea of comfort and peacefulness. Uh, and it is always, like I said, contrasted uh, with and pitted against the uncivilized wild life of Weathering Heights. Uh, you can always tell, I mean, look at the house inside and outside. This is uh, Thrush Cross Grange, which is obviously different uh, from the other house. Okay, Doctor, so we're, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can we say that when we uh, compare between the two houses, we are comparing between two uh, social classes or no? Um, uh, actually, um, no, uh, because the, the two, uh, yani when, when we read the novel, we're going to find that the, the, two, um, the two families are now rich and everything. Even Heathcliff, who started, um, you know, um, um, you know, you know he start, we don't know where, where he, he came from, and obviously he was poor and from a uh, poor class. Uh, when when we see the novel, when we read the novel, we don't feel that it's a struggle of classes. It's uh, as the struggle and the conflict is, or the contrast is between manners and behavior. Yeah, uh, the focus is more on civilization and the lack of civilization. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, we, we'll talk about the different interpretations uh, of the novel. And, and how uh, Heathcliff can be also uh, be, uh, and his behavior can be, uh, you know, some kind of revolution. He is starting a revolution, uh, but when, when he was uh, dehumanized, when he was poor, uh, at one point, uh, some critics are going to refer to him as representing the poor who are obviously taking revenge from the rich. But in this sense, it can be a struggle of classes, like you say. Other than that, uh, there are more uh, or clearer comparisons that, that can that we can make against civilization, in nature, um, you know, good behavior and the lack thereof, um, Victorian ideals and the lack thereof, and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> But this is Nelly, uh, and Nelly happens to be the main narrator. Uh, you have a frame narrator who is, uh, you know, kind of um, introducing the narrative, and then he leaves the narrative to Nelly. Um, he takes, obviously, he takes down notes, and then he re-narrates. So Nelly, uh, as of um, chapter four, she takes uh, over the narrative. And Nelly happens to be a maid. Uh, she started in, um, I think, Weathering Heights when she was young. She, she was with them, and then she went to uh, the other house. She knows she has a very close relation with every single member. And she raised them up. And uh, the problem with Nelly is that she is confusing the objective with the subjective, the fact that she sometimes she sticks labels to the character. She doesn't give us the opportunity to think for ourselves as readers. Sometimes she imposes 
her own views about the, the, the characters. And, and that would make her uh, an unreliable narrator. So you, uh, if you have a narrator who says everything, who uh, even you know assesses the characters and gives you uh, his own assessment of the different characters, he obviously he or she leaves you uh, nothing. And in this sense, uh, uh, they give you their own, uh, their views, and uh, uh, they, um, they their views are not necessarily correct. So in this case, we call uh, this kind of narrator unreliable, and she happens to be an unreliable narrator. Uh, this is about the house, the other ha house, the grange, and like I said, uh, the grange is uh, whatever. Uh, Weathering Heights is not in terms of organization, in terms of decency, and all uh, these kinds of things. So uh, uh, at this point in the narrative, the Grange would represent home, uh, while Weathering Heights would represent um, a prude, um, a prude in terms of being uncanny, in terms of being unhomely, unfriendly, uh, and all, uh, violent, and all these kinds of things. So they would even compare the Grange to paradise, while they would compare uh, Weathering Heights to hell. <clears throat> so do we have mysterious inhabitants in the novel? Yeah, of course. And, and on top of them would be, uh, of course, uh, Heathcliff. OK, again, uh, you need to always remember that that Lookwood comes from the South. Uh, and the South has values that are different from uh, the values of the North. Like I said, the people in the North are rough, are rustic, are for the most part uneducated. That's where the marshes and the um, uh, the moors uh, and the villages are in, in England. But uh, the south is um, normally, um, um, you know, the place where, um, you know, middle and higher middle class uh, people live. It's the place where uh, it's full of universities, it's full of education and civilization. So uh, Lookwood uh, goes to the north as a tourist, but he didn't expect to see this, um, you know, this atmosphere that is heavy, that is full of uh, violence, and um, you know, uh, it fell out of his expectation. He uh, he thought that when he goes to the south, to the north, he's going to find the same values uh, and the same moods and behaviors, and obviously, he was mistaken. So um, that's why he, he cannot understand the behavior of um, the, the family in, in Weathering Heights. Um, and of course, uh, on top of the things that he needs explanation for would be the character of Heathcliff, uh, his presence. I mean, because Heathcliff stands out as the most weird, the most strange, uh, and the most uncanny. Again, there is going to be a lot of reference to the fact that Heathcliff does not have um, a known origin. Uh, and there is always going to be this um, reference to the fact that he has a dark skin, uh, which would make him fearful uh, to others. He is a stranger, an outsider of a sort. Uh, you can always compare Heathcliff to the character of Othello, if you still remember. Othello and how he was unaccepted uh, uh, by the society and how he was led to kill his own wife because of his insecurities. You can always um, talk about Heathcliff as having his, also his own insecurities. The fact that he, he himself doesn't know uh, where uh, he, he is from, the fact that he has um, the, uh, a complexion that is obviously different from uh, the rest of the people, he is dark. Um, 
again, that would add to this atmosphere of gloom, this atmosphere of terror and fear that the clay is beset with. So uh, how does uh, Lookwood and the others uh, look at Heathcliff? Um, um, do they appreciate him being around? No, they normally refer to him as a foreign thing. He is, for them, he is a dark gypsy in appearance. Uh, it is true that he may be um, dressing in a gentlemanly way, but he, he, he's, remains uh, underbred. Uh, he is a stranger who does not fit in his surrounding. And of course, we spoke about his origin as being mysterious. Um, and even when he goes for three years and comes back, he comes up, uh, he comes back with a great wealth. People don't know uh, what he did uh, over the space of three years to uh, um, to have and collect this big wealth. Again, lots of question marks are around the character. Um, uh, you need to always remember that he has, uh, of all the other characters, he has only one name. We, we, we don't have Catherine William. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we don't have uh, Catherine uh, either. Uh, Heathcliff something. He doesn't have a family name. Everybody else has uh, a family name. So this lack of genealogy uh, is uh, unfamiliar, something that uh, people didn't hear of. Uh, all the other characters has family names, uh, Catherine Earnshaw, Catherine Denton, Herton Earnshaw, and so on and so on. Uh, again, we spoke about Heathcliff and whether Heathcliff has literary an antecedents, whether um, um, Heathcliff would uh, evoke in our minds um, other characters in, uh, his, uh, in, in literature. And uh, if you look back at the literature of the time and even beyond and before, you will have uh, uh, characters uh, in Byron's, Lord Byron's work that are similar to Heathcliff. Um, in the uh, course here, uh, which is obviously a, a work, you also have a, a character who is similar. Um, and, you know, he has this uh, a uh, strange mixture of attractiveness, um, uh, obsessive mentality, and even repulsive qualities. Um, it's, um, um, we have a poem, then the poem is long. You can always uh, refer back to it and see how similar uh, the character um, featured in the poem to Heathcliff is. <clears throat> Um, again, he would also be compared to um, Byron's uh, Manfred. Manfred is uh, a character in Byron's um, drama, and uh, he is also similar in terms of physique, in terms of how he looks, and also in terms of behavior. He is this hero villain of popular romances. Uh, do we have any other literary an, an antecedents, literary origins? Yes, we also have <clears throat> a novel by Anne Radcliffe, um, uh, and it's called uh, The Castles of Atl and, and Dunbane. And you have the character of Malcolm, who is very similar to uh, Heathcliff. Uh, both Heathcliff and Malcolm have wild, uh, terrific countenance. They look very strange, and they are wild in their behavior, and they are vicious in their actions. And they also take the property rights of um, 
hereditary owners of their houses. There, there will come a time when um, you know Heathcliff is going to take over as the owner of both um, Thrushcross Grange and uh, Wuthering Heights. Um, again, uh, as a reader in the Victorian age, you can always detect uh, similarities between Heathcliff and um, you know characters featured and presented in other literary works. Uh, again, how would Victorian leaders uh, react to what they see? Of course, they would feel uh, very disturbed by the character of Heathcliff in terms of his, um, you know, lack of origin, in terms of his uh, violence, um, in terms of his even his elemental passions and nature. Again, it's not only uh, Heathcliff, the other characters are also as violent. Uh, some people refer to the novel as a gothic romance with a gothic villain. So when I say gothic, what comes to your mind when I say this is a gothic novel? If I say that Wuthering Heights is a gothic novel, so what uh, do you understand from that? Yes. Horror? Yeah, go ahead. In, yeah, I'm telling uh, it means horror. Yeah, it has an element of horror to it. Uh, but there is obviously more to gothic romances than just horror. You have horror, you have, um, you know, women being dehumanized, you have revenge, you have revenge and blood, and you also have very strange. Uh, uh, castles. I mean, castles that look very weird and very uncanny. Uh, ghosts. And, uh, and you, you normally have ghosts within those uh, big uh, castles. Uh, and of course, you have, um, you know, the males are normally presented as being uh, villainous and very evil. So do we have echoes of that? in Wuthering Heights? Yeah, absolutely. We have um, Heathcliff as the gothic villain. You also have uh, a romance where you have Catherine falling in love with um, you know, Heathcliff, but it, it turns into a gothic romance where the end is not always um, you know, inviting. It's, it's full of violence. It's full of um, strange um, happenings. Um, so, uh, Weathering Heights in terms of length is um, a typical Victorian novel. Uh, I mean, it is divided into three volumes, like most of the novels at the time. Um, uh, some critics are saying that it started off as only one volume, but for some reason, and perhaps to, you know, kind of follow the rules of the time, uh, Emily Pronti has to develop it uh, into um, three volumes. Um, again, if we talk about the storyline, you have um, two uh, storylines, one uh, storyline of the old generation and the other of the younger uh, generations. You have, like we said, two narrators and multiple voices and multiple uh, points of view. Again, the theme is uh, a character in and of itself. Um, uh, and uh, by the theme, of course, and I'm talking about the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about the setting, and I'm saying that the setting is, um, uh, you can consider the setting a character because of how dynamic and how important its role is in furthering the action of the play. And by the setting, of course, I mean the two houses and what happened within them. Again, we have repetitions of everything, of names, of characters, of events. So it's a hybrid uh, kind of novel that that takes from different genres and techniques. So when I say that something is hybrid, it means that 
uh, it, it takes from here and there. Um, in Arabic, they call it um, uh, wait. Um, hmm. well, I don't know hybrid. Uh, when when you have different um, when you have for example a a hybrid uh, you know dog I mean uh, dogs have different um, you know types uh, sometimes you have a dog that is hybrid that is that it combines the features of different dogs and this is what we're having here in the novel it's a hybrid novel where we have elements of romance we have elements of realism. We have elements of the Gothic, so it is a hybrid novel or a cross generic novel. <clears throat> uh, we spoke about all of that. Um, some critics, because of how <clears throat> how hybrid and how uh, cross generic the novel is they would refer to the novel as being uh, a house where you have different rooms and these different rooms uh, would refer or would correspond to the different, different genres that you normally have in novels uh, sometimes you have a room that has gothic you have a room that has romance you have a room that um, has other genres it's more or less like a house of fiction uh, so it doesn't have a fixed uh, genre no it doesn't have a fixed genre i mean everyone is coming up with his own interpretation and they normally uh, you know uh, uh, find echoes of of a genre here or a genre there but basically it's a romance Basically, it's a gothic romance, but that that does not mean that it doesn't have other genres. Like uh, we at one point we're going to say that it is a realistic novel. Um, uh, some people are going to refer to how poetic uh, the um, the novel is, and that would make it um, perhaps a long um, uh, poem, if you like. So it's uh, again, it's full, it's full of genres. Um, speak, we spoke about narrators and narrative frames in the novel. When we spoke about Lockwood, who who, who introduces the novel, and then he um, uh, over time, um, you know, Nelly is going to take over and. Um, and it gives us uh, what happened and uh, wh what was happening. So look with the outside or the outsider tenant at the Grange uh, would introduce the novel as an outer frame reporting the narrative as told by Nelly. Again, he would also refer to the strangeness of, uh, strangeness of Wuthering Heights in top. In terms of events, in terms of characters. Uh, again, uh, you would look at Lookwood as a representation of the Victorian leader who is so used to certain values and ideals. Uh, we're talking about calmness, we're talking about decency, we're talking about civilization and safety and security. But obviously, he doesn't find any of that in the novel. Uh, his sense of estrangement reveals that he is not at home at Wedding. He doesn't feel at home. He doesn't feel comfortable at Wedding Heights. <clears throat> um, again, that would refer us to how Lukewood uh, look at the characters, look at the place. Remember, he is a representation of the values of South London, uh, of South um, England, and also uh, uh, of, um, of London. Again, as of chapter four, uh, Nelly is going to take over 
and Mary, of course, has been with them for years and years. She, she knows uh, the two houses in and out. Uh, again, what is perhaps uh, negative about uh, Mary being the narrator would be the fact uh, that she is not an objective observer. She um, she is not an objective narrator. She uh, justifies for the characters, evaluates them and gives us quick assessment of them. She doesn't leave the reader any chance to come up with his or her own interpretation of what uh, happened or is happening. Again, you need to always uh, remember that Nelly is not that well educated. So her, uh, even her judgments are going to be narrow minded. Um, again, she hates and loves, and that's very tricky and very easy. So you, uh, uh, readers are invited normally to uh, take whatever Nelly is saying with a grain of salt. We don't know whether what happened happened. We, we don't know whether what she says about Kat, uh, I mean, you know, Heathcliff is correct or wrong. So uh, she is a judgmental kind of narrator that uh, should be, uh, uh, yeah, people uh, or reader should be very uh, careful with her narration. Again, you have uh, Lookwood uh, as you know, giving us part of the story, and then Nelly, were, and you also have um, a third source uh, for the story, which is uh, Catherine's diaries. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, other characters from time to time will come over and tell uh, their part of the story. Uh, you will have letters, um, a letter by Isabella, Isabella and her letters. Isabella is obviously uh, going to get married to Heathcliff. They are going to elope and, uh, and they are going to get married and they will have a son. Uh, and the letters of Isabella is going to, uh, you know, kind of introduce another genre, which is the epistolary novel. The, the epistolary novel is this kind of novel where uh, characters are writing letters to each other. And of course, um, through reading those letters, you get to know about the plot and what happened and what is happening. Um, so what is the effect of all of that? When you have multiple narratives, when you have uh, lots of uh, narrators, uh, that would deny you as a reader an authoritative voice, which means that you are not given the opportunity to come up with your own conclusions about the characters. Uh, again, that would also leave you with the impression that perhaps those guys are not telling the truth. Perhaps I need to think twice about uh, whether what happened happened or not. Uh, if, if, if I'm told, for example, that uh, um, you know Heathcliff is torturing people, I need to think uh, whether this was uh, perhaps this is uh, you know some kind of bias or prejudice against Heathcliff because he is different because he is dark skinned. Perhaps the narrators, whether we're talking about, um, you know, Lookwood or Nelly, uh, perhaps they are um, being biased against Heathcliff because he is black and they are, or, or dark and they are white. Uh, perhaps they are exaggerating. So the burden of interpretation lies firmly with the reader. You need to be, as a reader, you need, you need to be on the lookout. You need to be on the alert. You need not to take uh, um, things for granted. You need to challenge uh, the narrative and see whether it makes sense or not. 
in terms of chronology, uh, the novel is uh, well written, especially the, the first part where the narrative is very straightforward. But over time, it becomes elusive uh, and enigmatic. And lots of um, critics pointed to the formal unity of the novel and they considered that uh, an achievement in and of itself. Uh, however, uh, remember we spoke about the so many uh, literary genres that we have and those, uh, the incorporation of those varied literary genres would break the formal unity uh, of the novel and they, uh, they even confuse the reader and break his or her expectations. So remember we said that in terms of form, the novel is a, is a hybrid uh, type of novel where you have a mixed bag of genres. Um, again, having one single genre is very straightforward, while having so many genres may uh, you know, break the expectations of the reader and may even um, interfere and stand in, in the way of a good interpretation of the novel. So what are the genres that we have? We have romance and we also have realism. So uh, perhaps we need to define what a romance is uh, on the surface level and also on deeper levels. So romance uh, may uh, give you the impression that we have a love relationship, which we do between Heathcliff and Catherine. Uh, romance or is also um, a genre that used to, to be very popular during the, especially the Middle Ages, where you normally have um, you know, heroes and heroines, and they fall in love with each other, and those uh, romances would, uh, you know, kind of represent the ideals of knighthood and chivalry and all these, uh, uh, all these kinds of things. Um, romance would also uh, give you this sense of, um, you know, revolution and this sense of, um, you know, lack of, um, you know, uh, I mean, wild, wild behavior and wild uh, atmosphere, because you can always link it to uh, romantic uh, poetry and ro rom romanticism, where the focus is on the occult, the focus is on whatever is strange, whatever is uh, natural. So it can be, in this way, it can be, whether in heights can be uh, called a romance on the different levels. So uh, uh, as a romance, you, you have a love story with strong declarations of love between Heathcliff and Catherine. And their love is even romanticized. When people, I mean, talk about this love, they even take it uh, out of the realm of the possible to the realm of the impossible and the imaginary. Uh, of course, when we talk about romances, we talk about uh, you know, imagination, and this is happening, of course. We're talking about the romantic period where literature was uh, wild and uh, imaginary. <clears throat> Uh, and even if I say that it is a romance, uh, even the word romance uh, itself, in terms of meaning, means uh, a novel. So it is a novel. Uh, even in French, we, we call it roman. Roman in French means novel. So on, on, on the different levels, this is uh, romance. Um, again, it is a romance and it is also a gothic romance. The gothic uh, part would add uh, to the elemental and wild um, you know, nature of this kind of novel. Uh, if I say gothic, I'm referring to the fact that it has an element or a measure of terror. 
We're talking about remote areas. We're talking about storms, shadows, apparitions, and in present days. And we all, we have all of that in in the novel, right? Uh, at one point, uh, Kathy and Isabella are not allowed to live with them in heights, which feminists consider as a symbol of women's oppression and show that the novel used Gothic elements. <clears throat> uh, again, uh, there are variations. Uh, if I say that it is a Gothic romance, it doesn't mean that it typically follows uh, um, in uh, Gothic, uh, whatever is Gothic and whatever, uh, I mean, whatever is Gothic romance, it can have its uh, changes and twists. But in, in Gothic romances, for example, you usually have passive and virtuous and oppressed uh, characters, uh, female characters. Uh, in our case, we don't have passive characters. Look at Catherine, the old Catherine, and how daring she was. Look at even her uh, daughter. These are not passive characters or virtues in, in the conventional sense of the word. Look at what Catherine did. Catherine, the old Catherine, fell in love with somebody without uh, origins. And obviously, this is a big thing to defy your own family and their wishes and decide to fall in love with somebody with known with no known origin uh, is a big thing, right? Um, she kept loving him against all uh, the odds. <clears throat> Again, you don't have um, <clears throat> uh, the characters in Wuthering Heights, unlike the uh, the characters in, in Gothic novels. Um, are no easy characters. They are able to scratch, tear, bite, and slap. Uh, some uh, people also refer to the novel as being uh, a realistic novel, where there is realism. Realism means that you have, that it mirrors, um, you know, um, events, um, I mean, real events, and it also depicts um, daily life concerns. And, um, yeah, in a sense, that that is true. I mean, when you even when you talk about the characters, when you talk about the uh, different uh, levels uh, of um, um, of livelihood, I mean, when you look, when you put the character of Heathcliff as a representation of the poor against the, the, the other characters, and so that can give you uh, a sense of how realistic the novel is. Uh, so the truth of social exclusion, we have social exclusion where some of the characters are excluded, like Heathcliff, for example. We have economic disposition. Uh, at one point, Heathcliff will come over rich, and he is going to dispossess uh, uh, the owners of the two houses of their uh, positions. Uh, you have everyday domestic details. Um, um, again, the characters, and these are characters that you normally uh, meet in, in normal life. Uh, the plight of homeless displaced children. I mean, when you look at Heathcliff and see how he was orphaned uh, and how he is homeless, this was um, actually a familiar occurrence in Victorian England. Um, at the time, um, there were homeless children uh, and Heathcliff is a reflection of just that. And, and even other novelists like uh, Charles Dickens refer to that. And that would reflect the condition of England.
Again, this is basically what the chapter is about. Do you have any questions? No, doctor, it's very clear. Thank you. OK, let's move to the other chapter, which is, um, like I said, more or less um, 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 you know, a continuation of uh, what we said um, in chapter five. It is more or less like an elaboration uh, on and an expansion uh, you know, of the ideas that we have spoken about in five. I'll give you five minutes. Um, I'll give you a five minute break and then when we come back, we start the new chapter. Okay, everyone. Okay, doctor.
لو كلمة لو لو دكتور يس دكتور يس اوكي So are we yes, all sir. back? Yeah, I think we're all back, right? So let me check how many people are. Hmm. Okay. You guys have any questions? No, doctor, thank you. Everything so, is clear. So how do you find the novel so far? Really interesting, yeah. yeah. What? <laughs> it's very interesting. I like it so much. Okay, fine. So um, it would be interesting or or not interesting. Just uh, I mean, just I mean, give me. Uh, you know, elaborate. If you say it's interesting, yeah, it's because of this and that. If you think it's uh, not, it's because of this and that. Let's start with Lujain. Uh, you mean Wuthering Heights, right? Yes. Uh, so I liked the strong feelings mm. in the novel, like uh, Heathcliff's feeling of love, hate, revenge. It was really strong. So. But don't I you thought, think that this is overly strong? This is uh, sometimes we call it elemental. Elemental means very extreme. Don't you think that this is extreme, uh, Lujain? Yeah, it's really extreme. So if it's very extreme, so what is, um, you, you know, what is it that you like about it? Then obviously you are a moderate individual. I know you. Um, uh uh, yeah, go on, go on. I mean, I see the uh, strong feelings, even if it was mental illness, feeds the novel and feeds mm. the literary work and, and makes it uh, more better. And um, especially if the author was really, uh, especially if the author was really talented to um, makes us feel his feeling like his pain his anger so and how his love uh, led to everything and his uh, poor childhood mm. so it's all connected together you mean you, you you identify with the character of Heathcliff identifying with the character means that you feel for him you like him you relate to him are you uh not really yeah. but mm. I just want to say I don't blame him because they treated him so bad mm -hmm. so they should just uh, <laughs> accept what would happen to him to yeah, them but don't you think that he uh, yeah he carried it to extremes I mean he was extreme in his revenge which is obviously not very human right and even yeah, the idea sure. of taking the law into your hand is not acceptable. Obviously, the novel is not an invitation for people to take the law into their hands, right? Yeah, I actually, I don't say that I'm, in, I'm on his side, but uh, the word's not perfect. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you don't accept treating someone so badly then uh, he could be a really good person. Like, he could when he owned the Withering Heights, uh, like, don't expect that he could uh, care about um, Catherine's family after what they did. Uh -huh. And actually, if he did, I think the novel would be very boring. Mm. Yeah, that's a point, yes. Yeah, that's the interesting part. I mean, the revenge and all. Uh, which is which makes which makes it gothic. Yeah, I mean, for you, yeah. it's a gothic novel. And it has those elements of the gothic to it. I mean, uh, dehumanizing um, and treating women in in a negative way and uh, um, exercising all forms of violence, uh, sparing nobody, obviously, right? Yeah, and I think that extreme. Uh is the reason why Wuthering Heights is really famous. I mean, it's the only uh, work for Emily. 
but it's really famous and um, it's considered a figure of the Victorian art, uh, Victorian literature. You mean it's a Victorian classic? Yeah. Right. Um, I think she wrote other novels, and you know, just to set the record straight. Um, uh, um, again, remember when we said that we also have literary antecedents. We have uh, people who wrote or created characters like Heathcliff in, um, uh, be before Emily Fronty. She may have been inspired by, by those. Um, you know, literary works, as we're going to see in chapter six. Okay, Lujain, thank you so much. Can we have somebody else reflecting on what is happening, good, bad, whether you like the novel, you don't know. Somebody said that it is heavy-handed, which um, I agree with. Razan, go ahead, Razan Samir. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Is, is the mic working? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Uh, from my point of view, the novel is interesting because of the sense of realism. Mm. So what is realistic about the novel, uh, Razan? I think uh, some points can give a listen to the reader. Mm. That, may, that makes it didactic, not realistic. Are we confusing uh, between realism and didactism? Realism is when, when you have, um, I mean, perhaps everyday details, things that you can uh, find in, in the age. If you read about the age, you find that the novel reflects uh, ideas uh, uh, in and about the age. Do we have that? Uh, the concepts of uh, the two houses and the different values. Yeah, then we have values, Victorian values, but those values are for the most part being violated yes. and challenged, right? Which is realistic. I mean, yes. sometimes you uh, create a novel and you assault and attack prevailing values because you don't like them, which makes you realistic, right? Yes. Yeah, that's it. Any other insights that you would like to share with us? Yes, uh, the idea of, the, of uh, what is the vocabulary again? You told me that it's didactic. That uh, it's didact didactic. Didactic, yes. Yes. Uh, it uh, gives a listen. Mm. Uh, simply, um, to explain it in a simple way, because uh, Mr. Aaron Shaw uh, treated uh, his children differently, Heathcliff became uh, a victim. They uh, treated him badly. And, well, actually, uh, and Shaw, I mean, obviously liked everybody. Uh, you mean uh, he uh, showed more love towards yes. Heathcliff than uh, towards his his own flesh and blood son? Yes, uh, he was his favorite, and it was obvious. You mean this was counterproductive? This was bad. Yes, because this is a takeaway. Not everyone, Something. Oh, not yes. everyone will understand the kindness. Ah, yes, that's interesting. That's you know, interesting. even uh, even uh, in uh, our everyday life, some people don't understand normal kindness. Yes, yes, that's true. Here actually, I, actually, yeah. I I uh, I experienced this many times. Because, you know, uh, sorry to say this. That's okay. Um, my mother is my mother and my father because my fa my family is divorced. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because of my illness as a CP patient, since my childhood, she is uh, with me 24-7. So, when, uh, when, us, when other people see how uh, close we are, they told her, Oh, well, what's uh, they used to say? Oh, what's wrong with you? You have other four yes. daughters. What's wrong yes. with you? Mm. But they, uh, they uh, judge her. Uh, they judge but, her. But this is not the, the, the true story. And um, you're trying to say that she treats everyone equally, uh, right? Yes. Uh, oh. Everyone loves her and she is great. And my sisters are great. And everyone is positive. But 
when someone who doesn't know how how a strong fighter she is, they mm. start to judge. Yeah, yeah. That's so this uh, this novel uh, gave me a strong flashback. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I would like to take the opportunity and um, again congratulate your mom on your decency, your big mind, and, and everything. Um, uh, can we have uh, Taima want, wanted to say something? Go ahead, Taima. Yes, doctor. Actually, I um, admire how she reflects um, like uh, the, the effect of uh, the first generation's uh, um, actions or uh, uh, behaviors uh, to the second generation. You know, it's like uh, the history is repeating itself. It's actually something very interesting and it's not uh, common or known at that period. So uh, this is the most, uh, uh, let me say, sophisticated uh, feature of this uh, novel. Yeah. Uh, do you think that she succeeded in doing that? Um, aren't we confused and uh, perplexed sometimes? Uh, repetition of names, repetition of uh, even plots, even um, violence. Do you think she was successful in? in um, it was kind of complicated. It was mm -hmm. kind of complicated, but it actually makes it. Um, like interesting, you want to solve the puzzle, something like that, you know? That's interesting. Yeah, good. Okay, Taina, thank you. Anybody else before we uh, go back? Somebody is raising her hand or his hand. So, yes, that's. Ah, uh, yeah. What's your El name? Elisar. Elisar, hi, how are you? Hi, doctor, how are you? Actually, I love this uh, this novel because of the psychological circumstances that I found it in it. So there is a lot of uh, results, and it showed me that each person is the result of his interaction with the environment around. So also, uh, it highlighted the woman characteristics, like uh, Catherine, how she changed by just staying five weeks in uh, other house. Yes. So she changed her mind uh, about uh, about Hatcliffe and she got in love with uh, Edgar and also her character changed from being boyish to, uh, to a lady. So each person is a result of the interaction of his environment. Also, it gave a good lesson about parenting, about never, uh, uh, never treating kids uh, differently and not getting another kid into your house, uh, it, it will create like a competition between uh, the kids at the home. Uh, and this uh, leads for a lot of uh, like black, um, you know, black people food for the yeah. novel. Yeah, people hating each other, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So, and also it gives a lot of lessons in moral and... Uh, Actually, it's more psychological. I'm a big fan for psychology, so I found it like it it, it attracted me. It took me so much, so I I'm so excited when I'm reading and hearing about this novel. That's interesting. It's good to know that uh, it appeals to lots of people. Um, again, I, I wouldn't agree more with what you guys have been saying that the novel has been deep as as um, I mean, giving you know more, yeah, more moral lessons and uh, being educational, um, being um, you know, giving us insights into how to uh, raise our kids and, and and a lot more. Thank you for your insights. So let's go all the way back to chapter six and continue story. So it's uh, chapter six, everyone. And it's uh, Emily Pronte again, Weathering Heights, and this time around it's approach. So we're focused on the approach uh, part of the story. We've been talking about home um, 
and uh, whether the um, the novel is you know honoring those concepts of home victorian concepts of home or not and we have found that uh, on more one uh, on more than one level the novel is violating those um, you know victorian ideals of home there is obviously nothing homely about weathering heights in uh, many uh, instances and in many uh, and on on many occasions um, so we're moving now towards the idea of a prod. and let me just remind you of what a prod meant for the victorians a prod, a prod meant whatever is uncanny whatever is unfamiliar whatever is unfamiliar right whatever is weird and perhaps whatever is gothic uh, so we're going to see this happening in the novel. Um, actually, chapter six uh, and the examples that we're citing are an enactment of the idea of a prude as the Victorians un understood it. OK. So um, what is it that we're targeting this time around? We're exploring the idea of a prod in the text. And of course, the text here means weathering heights, while continuing to develop your understanding of the theme of home. So again, we're going to be pitting the two concepts against each other. Again, home and a prod. Um, we'll talk more about the idea of genre and how cross-generic cross and hybrid uh, this novel is. And we'll expand on, on the concept of the reader and how the reader interprets uh, the novel. Um, I would like you to focus on the picture that we have here. Um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, uh, give me your impressions about the picture. What does it tell you? Very wet. This picture is very wet. Give me a word, a word that sums up the whole idea here in the picture. Yeah. What? It seems like uh, it seems like what? It's somewhere on the Yorkshire moors. Something. Yeah, like and, and give me an adjective that describes um, what you see. Is it gothic? Can I can I describe this scene as gothic? There is. Is there anything that uh, would indicate that this is gothic? And if it's yeah. not gothic, it is what? One word, one adjective. An adjective that we've been using for quite some time. Wouldn't you describe that as very romantic? Isn't that romantic? What do you think? Uh, obviously, yeah. um, uh, we don't have uh, th this woman is not a mother and uh, this guy is not her son, right? Yeah, it's romantic. Uh, oh, yeah, it's um, um, a romantic scene where you have a lover and his lady love. And, and also what, what, there is a strong imagination. Uh, yes, and the, uh, the best is very stuff. romanticized even, right? Where you have yeah. storms and right? Uh, which means that we are together no matter what, against all odds. Isn't that uh, what romanticism in the modern sense is about? The idea that two lovers are together no matter what and against all odds. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Could we consider a work uh, is romantic even if it's not from the romantic uh, period? 
Yeah, it depends on what you mean by romantic. Romantic, like we said in the previous chapter, has so many meanings. One of them happens to be having a love uh, relationship. Mm. So uh, it's not just about the, the period. Um, yeah, uh, it can be about the period. This is an aspect that can be also, uh, um, you know, um, reflecting or uh, revealing um, a, a relationship of a sort. Uh, the problem with people uh, when we study the romantics is that they always associate romanticism with love, uh, love relationships. Uh, so we try to tell them that there is obviously more to romanticism than just a love relationship. Uh, again, this is an aspect and this is something that we have seen in the novel. We have seen this you know, very agitated love affair between uh, Catherine and, and Heathcliff. Um, okay, and the atmosphere is uh, in the background is very uh, romantic in the sense that it is very wild where you have uh, mountains, you have a uh, storm. Uh, they are obviously on the verge of, uh, I don't know whether they were stranded in the middle of nowhere or something. Um, again, we're, we're back to the idea of coarseness and violence. The fact that uh, uh, people um, in the British media at the time um, referred to the novel as being coarse or rough. Uh, but they, they, they could see some power and some originality uh, in the novel. Um, the uh, Roman, I mean, the Americans, the American critics would focus <coughs> on whatever is negative about the novel, uh, whatever is rotten about the novel, whatever is violent. And there is, um, this is one of the basic differences between how the British, uh, how British critics looked at the novel and how their American counterparts uh, did. Okay, so the novel itself, uh, not the novel, I mean the setting itself in terms of, um, in terms of place is very uh, a prudish, if you like, where remember um, Wuthering Heights was on, and the place was on top of a hell, uh, it is not surrounded by any other, um, you know, buildings. It is um, in the, um, it's in a wild area in the moors, right? Uh, I mean, the atmosphere is normally stormy uh, and violent. Again, uh, we have Lookwood as a representation of the South, and he is giving, uh, is passing judgments on the North based on what he has seen and witnessed himself in terms of how people treated him, rough and tough, in terms of the place that uh, where uh, Wuthering Heights is located. So according to him, the North is strikingly other. And I, I think I need to stop and explain what uh, other mean. Normally, the word other in post-colonial literature uh, um, uh, is about whatever negative things you are trying to project to others. You have issues and problems and you try to project them to others. You're trying to deny that you have those issues and you try to kind of impose on other people and say, yeah, they are this and that. So this relationship of uh, the one and the other or the self and the other is uh, um, very uh, pre predominant in post-colonial -colon li literature. So um, um, we have, you know, different manifestations of that in all the novels and in all the uh, pieces of literature. Look at Othello, for example. Obviously, Othello is the other, 
um, in the sense that he is whatever um, his white uh, yani counterparts are not. He is savage, he is dark, he is non-Christian, he, he doesn't have values. Okay, so here the other uh, uh, would be Heathcliff primarily and also the other inhabitants of Wuthering Heights. Um, why? Because they behave in uh, uh, what people uh, are considering uh, otherly. I mean, other and otherly would have to do with being uh, foreign in your behavior, being foreign and strange in your life, in your in the the color of your skin and everything. So. <clears throat> So to look with the North is strikingly other, a foreign place. Uh, and that would apply to the inhabitants of the North, uh, chief on, uh, among them would be Heathcliff himself. Uh, OK, how do the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights who live in the North, how do they look on Lookwood? They are. They also consider him other. So, as you can see, the south and the north are other in each other. Are you getting the idea? Yes, doctor. So, the the concept of otherness is is it negative or positive? I'm asking you. I think it's positive because we can see how if one of them is looking to the. I'm another. talking, Jenna. I gave you examples of examples. what uh, of what other means. I mean, I mean the what other invokes and provokes and uh, uh, and let me give you another example. And obviously, you didn't understand. You didn't. Me. No, um, doctor. It's negative because uh, Kathleen, it's married uh, for. Uh, um, the George. Yeah, okay. Fine. Right. Um, again, let's look at how we look at the West, how we look at Europe and the United States, and how they look at us. Okay. Um, the West uh, and the United States and North America look at us in a negative way. They are othering us. According to them, we are the other. They are the self and we are the other. The other here means that they think that we are strange. They think that we are uh, perhaps uh, violent. Um, some of us are terrorists, right? All are negative qualities, right? Sometimes they see us bar barbarism or something like that. Yeah, barbarians. Oh, yes. Look at how we see them. We also other them. Sometimes we say that they, they are libertine. Uh, they are sexually forward. They don't have uh, moral values. We even attack their religions and talk about those religions in a negative way. So we are othering them. So the idea or the concept of other is a negative concept. When you other somebody, it means that you are referring to him in a negative way. OK, you are being uh, biased against him or her. OK, again, let's go back to Lookwood. Lookwood, who comes from the South, obviously he has certain values. He looks at the people of the north in Wuthering Heights as being other. OK, how do they look at him? They also look at him as other, as somebody who comes from the south. And for them, uh, the south are snobbish. The, the south are, uh, um, you know, um, you know, um, perhaps uh, exploitive and manipulative and everything negative. So we're always pitting the two houses against each other, right? 
and that would create uh, a conflict between northern ruler values and the more urban cultures of the south of India. So the north has rural values, village values. They don't have much access to education. They don't have to, they don't know how to, you know, kind of use certain words. They are very straightforward and very spontaneous. While the people of the south, the south of England, are more trained into giving you what you like in terms of sweet talk, in terms, they are <coughs> more civilized, they have urban culture, and so on. Um, and uh, critics are referring to that. They are if they refer to Wuthering Heights as home to a wholesome, primitive, and natural society pitted against the overdeveloped artificial culture of the Grand. So it's a praise and a, and, and a criticism at the self same time. Like this critic, Queenie Queenie Leaves, is referring to Wuthering Heights, the house as being primitive, okay, and natural. And uh, she is sitting it against the Grange, the other house, and she's saying that the other house is overdeveloped, which is obviously good, but they have artificial culture. Artificial means that it's not spontaneous, which is obviously negative. They have culture, it is true, but it is not natural. Okay, we have uh, Terry Eggleton, who is, um, you know, a Marxist critic, and he believes uh, that the novel is meant by Emily Pronte to demystify the Victorian notion of the family as a pious, uh, pacific space within social conflict. He's trying to say, in simple terms, is that. Um, Victorian values are, for the most part, false and fake, and they are not always, uh, you know, whatever values they, they have and promote and speak of are not normally implementable on the ground. Uh, we have this image of families as being pious and being uh, peaceful, but this is actually not happening uh, in actual life. So uh, again, according to Terry Eggleton, Emily Pronte is trying to say that there is obviously uh, uh, something that uh, the Victorians are hiding, which is the idea that they are not that pious, they are not that uh, morally upright. The, we have abuses of all sorts. Uh, we have corruption, we have all these kinds of things, and the novel uh, uh, Weathering Heights is a reflection of just that. Um, when you look at Heathcliff, he is a representation of the concept of a prod in the novel. Uh, how? Uh, the way he looks, obviously, if you look at him, uh, you would find that the, the color of his skin is not white. Remember, we are in England, and England, um, any Engli English people are whitish, right? Uh, in terms of where he comes from, and obviously we don't know wh where he comes from, he doesn't have an origin. Uh, and also the fact that he is named this. I mean, he has only one name, which is quite uh, uncommon in a society that honors uh, gene genealogy. Um, you have to have a family name to be, uh, to, you know, to brag with or about. So this is not happening. So as you can see, Heathcliff is an embodiment of the 
concept of approving the not. Uh, this is together with what he is going to do. So he was uh, representing this approved aspect of the novel when he was young, let alone when he um, comes of age, when he uh, um, uh, gets to reflect on what people did to him, and then he starts to take revenge. So he is, like I said, um, a, a true embodiment of the concept of approved with its negative associations. So Heathcliff is the most obvious representative of approved in the context of the local and domestic world of the novel. Uh, he enters the domestic scene from another world, from the streets of Liverpool. Um, even Mr. Earnshaw is referring to him as being either a gift of God or uh, um, he can also be uh, devilish. I mean, he, he, I mean, it seems that Mr. Earnshaw doesn't know yet. He has his own doubts and suspicions yet. According to Mrs. Earnshaw, uh, he is a gypsy friend. Uh, obviously, she was not very approving of the move that Mr. Ensho is taking by adopting him. See, he doesn't look like everybody else, right? Everybody else looks how? Looks white. So, uh, does does he remind you of? of somebody that we have taken before, a character that we have taken? Othello. Yes, Othello. Uh, Othello right? Uh, he has the same issues, obviously. This issue of recognition and acceptance, the fact that he is neither recognized or accepted, right? Where, where does this leave us? Um, would we be happy if we don't get recognized? Would we be happy if we don't get Accepted. Mm, what do you think? Obviously, we, we wouldn't. Um, okay, so how 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 does Mr. Linton see Heathcliff? He believes that he is um, a little Lasker, and a Lasker was uh, an American or a Spanish castaway. Uh, people who comes from Spain or North America, and they normally, uh, um, you know, they work on, on ships. And um, they live on the minimum, and sometimes they starve. Um, and those Spanish and American castaways might be runaway African slaves from South America or the United States. See, again, totally foreign. Um, according to Lockwood, the narrator, he is a dark-skinned gypsy in aspect. Again, it's this, I mean, a reinforcement of the same impression that we have. Again, would, uh, some people would refer to him as being of possible Irish background. Um, again, different origins. Um, some may take it uh, or refer to him as being an angel of revenge on behalf of a formidable collective of oppressed ethnic groups. So this is moving from the impressions of the characters themselves to an analysis and an, an interpretation of the character. They are trying to say that perhaps um, Emily Pronti has a political agenda. Uh, perhaps she was siding with the poor, with the um, underprivileged, those who don't have, and she is giving us Heathcliff 
uh, to uh, act as an angel of revenge. He is taking revenge on behalf of the dispossessed, on behalf of the poor, on, on behalf of the colored and, 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 and ethnic minorities of all sorts. So Nelly, how does Nelly see Heathcliff? Um, she believes that um, he, he is more or less, I mean, she's giving us a, rem a romanticized image of the guy, uh, saying that he, his father could be the emperor of China and his mother could be an Indian queen. So what a mix, what a romanticized image of the guy. So uh, very romantic, but in a gothic way, obviously, because of the violence that he emits out, because of how he looks and everything. Again, this is all uh, a prose. Um, again, we'll, we'll go back to uh, the idea of Heathcliff's foreignness and whether this has historical origins within the contemporary context uh, of the novel or not. Do we have, is he um, an echo of people and things that used to happen at the time <coughs> or not? Uh, guys, would you like us to stop on this note? And I know it's six minutes after two. Okay. As you like, doctor. Right. We're going to stop on this note and with this item. And I would like you, I'm inviting you to go to the slides and read them. Uh, read, the, uh, read the chapter, uh, chapter six. And the slides, like I said, is on the central LMS. You can access them and read them on your own. So next time we'll finish this off and start um, the sign of four, inshallah. Um, until then, uh, I wish you all the best. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for all your efforts.